So f first of all, a couple of things. What's this course about? It's about understanding who Jesus is. And it's about understanding the greatness of God, the triune God. So two things, those two things go together, actually. Jesus is God, and therefore any understanding of Jesus will give us a fuller understanding of who Christ, who God is. And it's about understanding also, as a kind of secondary, how he is more than enough for every detail of our life. He is more than enough for every detail. And that trusting, our, our trusting in him is the way that he is able to work out his purpose in our lives and actually in the life of the world. That when you think about it, of course God can do anything at any time, but that he's chosen to work through us. Christ is building his church through us. And so um, uh, that's kind of an enormous statement, actually, when you think about it, that he's decided that it's people like us that he will use to grow the church up and uh, and enable it to make a difference in the world. Um, so all of that really just to, um, just to kind of give some framework for what we're going to do. Um, I think the question, who is Jesus, is probably the, the most important question, isn't it, in life? Who is Jesus? Because everything hangs on him. Uh, we were having dinner last night and I was saying to someone that um, we know that God is good because of Jesus. We know that he is holy and righteous and honourable and uh, because of Jesus. We know everything about God, really, because of Jesus. And, um, and so that's really, I think, why, uh, why this course. And I want to begin in Philippians. Uh, we won't stay there very long, but it's just the personal testimony of Paul. Um, and his is really quite an amazing testimony because he had that ter terrific transformation on the road to Damascus. And so I don't know that mine was like that. My conversion experience wasn't like that. But I definitely think that the, um, the next stage of my Christian life was like Paul's. I feel like I was put into a um, kind of a box and, th and, th and st learning about the Lord was just everywhere in this box. It was almost like he'd put me in this place so he could inundate me with things about him. And um, at the time, I didn't realize that, of course, but when I look back, I think that. So when I read Paul's testimony, um, he's in, in Philippians 3, it's not really his testimony of that experience, but it's how that experience has changed his mind about everything else. And I think knowing, I, I mean, I know most of you very well here, and you know me. So you know there are things going on in our lives that are not easy. And, um, and that we have to work our way through. And knowing Jesus, who he is, and what he, what he is for us, is the only way, really, that we can do that. And so Paul, in Philippians 3, he's writing to the Philippians, and he's, he's trying to tell them something about himself. It's a wonderful letter, Philippians, actually. But he, in, in verse 7 of chapter 3, this is kind of what he, his, the, the gist of his testimony. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Knowing Christ, knowing him more and more, that's what Paul means. Knowing, not knowing about him, but knowing him by intimate, personal relationship. 
The, the word knowing here that is used, and actually the word for knowing that's used most of the times in the New Testament is a knowing by experience. It's a knowing in relationship. So it's not head knowledge. It's the knowledge that has an effect on, on every part of your life. It's an experience. And knowing Christ is what Paul was pressing on for. And he knew he wasn't where he wanted to be. He knew that he could know more. He could come into a stronger and deeper and wider relationship with Jesus. And that's quite an amazing thing, isn't it? Because he's already writing half the New Testament. So, um, but, so he knew there was more, but he wanted, he wanted to keep pressing on to get the more. And that's only because what he had already received was good. That's the thing. You don't press on for something, to, for something more if what you have already is not fulfilling and satisfying and, and kind of stirring you on. When you think about it, in, in that, that understanding of knowing, when Jesus is praying, you remember in John's Gospel, John, seven, uh, John chapter 17, he's with his, in his disciples, only with the 11 now, and he's, he's, he's praying for them. And in John 17, he, in verse 3, he says, uh, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So, knowing Christ, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That word knowing is, again, know by experience, know by relationship, that they might know you. And what he says there is that that is life. It's life. And he's talking about the sort of life that in John chapter 10, he said, was abundant. I came that you might have life and life abundant. So this kind of, what he's saying here is more or less what Paul's saying. I haven't attained what is there for me, but I'm pressing on to get what is there for me because I know it's there for me and I'm going to press on for it. And, and that pressing on is to something that I know will be better than anything I have now and it will be better than anything I can imagine. That's the thing, isn't it? You know, I, th I think I said, you know, we're all going through situations. My daughter-in-law is today in hospital, hopefully having part of her pancreas, if not all of her pancreas, removed because she has cancer that is metastasizing. She's not yet 40. She has two small children and she doesn't know the Lord. And I'm finding it so difficult, really, to talk to her about hope or about mm -hmm. peace or about any of the things that she desperately needs now because she doesn't know the Lord. Yeah. And, and, and it's really bringing home to me, you know, this, this understanding that you and I, we know Jesus. Mm -hmm. We know him. And we know him for who he is. We've got further to go. We're pressing on, like Paul, to, to, to get further into that relationship. But we already know him. And because we already know him, it alters our life. Radically and fundamentally changes the way we think and the way we experience other things. So I can say to you that because you know Jesus, I can say, do not fear, for he is with you. He is with you through every difficulty and every pain and every sorrow and every tragedy. He is there. But I, you can't say that and I can't say that to someone who doesn't know Jesus. So now you kind of get that picture, don't you? That knowing Christ, knowing who Jesus is, who is Jesus? The answer to that question is absolutely crucial, not just for eternal salvation with him, but for everyday ordinary life here. Because everyday ordinary life is hard. It's not easy. And, and if it's easy today, it won't be tomorrow. So that's the reason, really, the, you know. Um, so I think it's probably, when you know who Jesus is, you end up with this confident assurance, don't you? That, yes, today is hard, but he's going to walk through it with me. Yes, tomorrow may be more hard, but I'm not afraid of tomorrow. And I'm not afraid of all the other things that attack or come against us or, or just are part of this life, I'm not afraid of those because I know the one who has the victory mm -hmm. over all of them. And, and it's this lack of fear that Jesus brings to us, this lack of fear. And every time fear comes in or tries to come in, we have the weaponry to say, no, I'm not going to be afraid. I will not fear for I am his and he is mine. And that's what I want for this. I, I want this for all of us because, because I, f I think when I understand how difficult it is for people who don't know Jesus, 
I find in myself this desire to, to, to bring them to Christ so that they can have that possibility, that they can reach out to him. And that even if the worst happens, even if, it's, even if there is no human help or hope, they have a, an eternal hope in Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's what he promises, actually. And, um, and those of us who've trusted in him, uh, you're going to know everything I say. I'm, I don't think I'm going to say anything you don't already know. But I think I want to know this stuff again. I want to know it deeper. I want to know it more. And... Um, so that's why we're doing it. So Genesis chapter 1, we're going to go right back to the beginning. I'm sorry that we're all over the place. And if you want a list of the scriptures at the end, you can just ask me and I'll send you a list of them. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, we're introduced to God, aren't we, in Genesis 1? And I've said, I think I've said before, I must have read it somewhere. Um, it's almost like at the, uh, you open up the first page of the Bible and it's like when you're at the theatre, you know when you're at the theatre and this, it's dark, the stage is dark and you've just settled in and hopefully you haven't got popcorn or coke or whatever it is, you're just sitting there and you're waiting for the thing to begin. And before the curtains open onto the play, the author comes through this, the, this, the curtains and he just stands there. And he's going to describe to you how he wrote the play. He's, he doesn't tell you where he was before or who he had coffee with or where he lives or anything. He just walks onto the stage and he says, this is what's going to happen. This is what's happening. And I feel like God does that in Genesis 1. It's like, you don't, he doesn't say, well, this is what I was doing before this. He just literally walks onto the stage and he says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light and there was light. That, that sentence actually in the original Hebrew is, then God said, light and there was light. It wasn't let there be light because that's almost a question, let there be or let something happen. It was just light and there was light. And, um, and, and what we're introduced to there in that verse is, in the beginning, God, the word for God there is Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. And El is a very familiar word. It's used all the way through scripture. It was a very familiar word, word in Hebrew for God or any type of God. It was just a mighty one. And the word him, H-I-M, at the end is a plural ending on a, on a noun. So the word for God there is, could be gods, actually, in the beginning, gods. But it isn't gods, many gods. It's a plural ending on a singular beginning. And so you're automatically, if you knew the Hebrew, you would be automatically introduced to a God who is presenting himself as more than one. As one, but more than one. I mean, I don't know how we can understand that exactly, except that in the language it's been deliberately spoken and written in that way. In the beginning, God, plural, created the heavens and the earth. And knowing that, don't you think that then gives us a bigger understanding of John chapter 1. You don't have to go there if you don't want to, but John chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, uh, well, in fact, all the way down to 14, where John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. It's like John is, is understanding, and you know, obviously because the Holy Spirit is inspiring him, he is understanding Genesis chapter 1, and he is bringing that into the life of Jesus, and he is saying, in the beginning was the word, and that word was the light of men. It was life, and it was the light of men. And that word is the creation agent, the, the agent of creation. Then God said, light, and in his speaking, light happens. And John takes that in John chapter 1 and he applies that to Jesus because right down in verse 14 
You've heard the beginning. He says, well, in, in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. So there's no doubt here that John is talking about Jesus, and he is talking about the creator God. That the creator God is Jesus Christ, and Christ is the creator God. Um, so the name Elohim in Genesis is used, in Genesis chapter 1 is used 32 times. 32 times a plural God spoke, and this is what happened. This is what happened. Um, uh, for example, it's our, and used afterwards, so usually after Genesis, it's used uh, as a double word, and it's used as Jehovah God, or Almighty God. Um, and in Deuteronomy 10, verse 17, you read that Jehovah Elohim is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, um, the God or, who is great and mighty and powerful and dreadful. So the names of God through from Genesis all the way through, to, through the Old Testament are all descriptions of the character of God. And Jesus uses those names to describe himself. That's the connection, and that's why we want to look at it. So if I wanted to go back at what happened to talk about something that happened. In fact, that's probably what we're going to do for most of this morning, is to look at what happened when a person saw God or had a conversation with him. And you'll know this, you'll know this very well. Remember when Moses is walking along and he sees a bush that's burning, and he, he turns aside. In Exodus 3, verse 1 to 15. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me, Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you brought the people out of Egypt. You shall worship God at this mountain." Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, this you, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. I was thinking a lot about Moses, you know, and you, you know, of course, that he was 80 when he had this experience. And that's so encouraging to me. <laughs> Not that I'm close to 80 yet, but it is very encouraging to me. And uh, it's also interesting, when I thought about Moses, I thought, you know, Moses had 40 years in Egypt where he really thought he was a somebody. And I had 40 years where I thought I was a somebody. And then he had 40 years in the desert where he realized he was a nobody. 
He was a nobody. And then he had, and then, Mo, and then God introduces himself to Moses. I think there's something significant in that process that Moses at 40 was ready to go out and battle. He was ready to kill the Egyptian and do this and do that, ready for, to fight for God and for the people. But he still thought he was a somebody. And so God took him out of there into the wilderness and he had to live for 40 years tending sheep and to realize that he really wasn't a somebody. And you can see he thought he knew he was a nobody by his conversation. You know, how, how am I going to do that? Who's going to do that? And he, he's going to go on in these chapters to talk about that. Until in the end, he's going to make God quite angry because God's going to say, I'm with you. You don't have to worry. But Moses is so aware of his own insignificance now that he's, he's, he thinks he's not able to do what God is calling him to do. So I thought that was really interesting for us because, you know, no matter how old, no matter how lowly, no matter how weak, no matter our past, no matter our present, no matter anything about us, we're not looking at ourselves, we're looking at God. This course is who is Jesus, not who are you. This is all about the risen Jesus Christ and what he is going to do with and through and for you, me. And that's really interesting, isn't it? Because when you look at this passage really detailed, you see what happens here. In verse 3, there's the bush is burning. And in verse 3, Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this, this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. And in verse 4, when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, he called to Moses. See, you have to turn aside, don't we? We have to turn aside to look. We have to look at God. We have to look at who he is. And we have to look at this word and say, I'm going to turn aside and I'm actually going to read these verses. And that's why I kind of decided when I wrote this, this course, I'm going to read all the scriptures that I can. Because I have a tendency not to read them out. I have a tendency to start talking about what they mean before I'm actually reading them out. And I don't want to do that because my words have no power. This word has power. And so it's important, isn't it? And I think it's only when you start to think, well, this is really important and these words actually have power that you see these things that actually Moses turned aside. And when God saw that he had turned aside, it was then that he spoke. We have to turn aside and we have to decide we're going to really try to understand more about this Christ and, and not just know about him, although obviously that's how it begins, but to, but to go much deeper in our relationship with him and to ask him how, how, you know, how I can go deeper with you. How can I, how can I receive more, you know, um, he turned aside and Moses and God spoke. And I think I've written here, all that God demands of a person is our availability. That's all. He doesn't need anything else. What you were is totally irrelevant to God. Your nationality, your education, your personality, they are of no importance. It's not that God doesn't love you for who you are. Of course he does. But that's not what he needs in taking you on. And in fact, sometimes, often, things in our personality hold us back from going on with the Lord. Because our, our upbringing, our thinking about ourselves, or what we were and what we're doing now, tend to be negative. We tend to negatively look at ourselves after we've come to the Lord and think, like Moses did, I can't do this. Or, and God's conversation with Moses is, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this through you. So um, he takes you where you are and he brings glory from it. He brings glory through you. I mean, that's an amazing statement, isn't it? That he would bring glory through us. Mm. Quite incredible. And then you read about people, don't you? You read about Hudson Taylor. I've got a list of them here. George Muller, Moody, Gladys Alwood, Elizabeth Elliot, all the people whose lives have made history. They've made history. And why did they make history? Because they all understood they couldn't do it. They all understood that without God, they could not do it. 
It's not the names of the people that, that had this massive opinion of themselves that did great things for God. It's those people that you would never have heard of otherwise. Totally insignificant people who God used to bring about massive things. Hudson Taylor is responsible probably single-handedly for the gospel going to China. Of course, there were other people who were there and followed him, but when you think about what he did and how he lived and how he decided to infiltrate the Chinese culture, actually, and to live as a Chinese person, he is the one who took the gospel into places that no other missionaries at the time were doing. And it was because he knew himself to be totally dependent on God. Totally dependent. And they, they, you know, he discovered, he, if you read his book or his, the autobiographies that are written about him, you see that he understands that everything he's going to do and everything he is is totally dependent on God. George Muller, I mean, you read his book. It's an amazing account of someone who, who totally and utterly depended on God. And he started how many orphanages and schools and, uh, I mean, just did tremendous work with children in, Bristol, in the Bristol area. God had something to say to Moses, and I think that it probably was a bit like this. You know, he... He probably said to Moses, don't you think, well, I think you've turned around because you think this bush is really fantastic. Well, it is, because Moses said, I must turn aside and see this marvelous sight, the bush that's burning. And, but what God's going to tell him through the conversation that, that goes on is that it could have been a tree. It could have been a stone. It could have been anything. It's not the bush burning that's the thing. It's that I am here in your presence, and I am calling you through this. You know, and I, again, I thought to myself, how much of our church is looking for the miracle and the sign, and they're looking at that miracle, and they're thinking that's it. And it's actually the God within the process who is it, who is the thing. You know, I was thinking, you know, really, Lord, can I really say who is Jesus? I mean, we've just had following Jesus as the course. I mean, it's all going to get a bit confusing. Nobody's going to know where we are. And really, that's not pizzazzy enough, is it? It's not snappy enough. Who is Jesus? You want to catch people. You want to, you know. And, and all the time, I know that God's showing me, even in this first session, he was showing me, you don't need pizzazz. You don't need anything. You don't need anything. You just need people who know they have nothing to give to turn aside and look at my word. Look at my word. Mm. And I mean, it's, you know, you can probably see it's already spoken to me. Um, and I've written here, you know, have you ever come into the place where you realize that all you can produce at your best is ashes? Have you ever come to the place where you presented yourself as who you really are and that is nobody? And have you ever come into that place and said to God, you know, will you fill me with who you are? With who you are? And, and kind of stepped out in the strength of that. That he will fill you with who he is and you will step out into a new place with him. God's answer to uh, Moses, as we, as we saw, I read, he said, God says to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And uh, Jesus uses that same name in John chapter 8. So if you go to John chapter 8, he uses the... Uh, Ego Amy, that's how it reads in, in Hebrew, it's, uh, in Greek, sorry. Ego Amy, E-G-O, it's two words, E-I-M-I, -I, and it means I am, I exist, I am. Um, so John chapter 8, verse uh, 28, John 8, 28, that's where we'll start. And we'll just go through this passage. Um, because Jesus uses that name that God has used to Moses. And remember, 
Jesus is using, is talking to Jews. So he's talking to Jews who will know the history of Moses leading their, their people out of, uh, out of Egypt. And he will know that the, they will know the scripture which says, I am has sent you. So now Jesus is here and in John chapter 8, he's going to use the same title, the same name. Verse, um, chapter 8, verse 28. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And he spoke these things. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been a slave to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. So I speak things which I have seen with my father, therefore you also do the things which you heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said, if if God were your father, you would love me, for I have proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my, uh, my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I will be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. I am. It's a long passage, but it's really interesting, or important, I think, that we read it, because Jesus is speaking to Jews who should know him, and actually who claim to know God. So he's speaking to... uh, People, he he kind of should expect that they would receive him and accept him. But they don't, and they don't because he's saying, you are not actually of Abraham. You are not of God. You are actually of the devil. Because there is a divide between believers and Mm non-believers. Non-believers are under the authority of Satan. Mm -hmm. Believers are under the authority of God. And when you are under the authority of God, No work of Satan can come at you except what God understands and has already provided protection for. The only reason that we are beset with this idea that demons can come in or can take over is because we don't know the word. 
and we are not prepared to hold it up as the defense against the lies of the enemy. Now, I'm not saying those lies don't come at the right time and they don't do, try to do you in. Of course, Satan is clever and he's able to do those things and they do have effect, of course, of course, because we, we're not yet where we want to be. We're not yet made in exactly like Christ and we are affected by them. But the defense is always the same. Submit yourselves to God, i.e. believe in the word of God, believe in the person of Jesus Christ, believe that he has victory over the enemy. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Nothing is simple in life, of course. Nothing is simple. But the word of God is the word of God. And the God who said light is the God who said, I am here in Jesus, I am. So he says, and, and the thing is, you could say, well, that's a fairly, you know, it's a strange way to put it, but did they really understand what he was saying? In the very next verse, you know they did. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. They picked up stones to throw at him because they knew what he was saying and what he was calling himself. And later on, they'll say that he made himself equal with God. He was trying to make himself equal with God. And there's lots of scriptures in John um, they understood that Jesus was calling himself God. They knew what they were refusing, that is. They knew what they were refusing. And that's the truth throughout scripture, isn't it? That God has made himself evident in creation and inside every person. And he definitely made himself evident to the Jewish nation. And they knew that they were rejecting the one who called himself God, the Savior. They knew that in the Old Testament, God says, there is no Savior but me. And Jesus coming along, saying that he is the saviour, he is the Messiah. So um, Jesus is God, he claimed to be. And, uh, and actually, that led me on to a slightly different tangent that, you know, don't you think that we have kind of dethroned him in our day? We've sort of weakened him, Jesus, because we've made him all about helping us and loving us and and that's all true he does love us and but it's almost like he's he's he, he's not exalted he's not worshipped he's not kind of lifted up to be magnificent and majestic in some way i think we've made him weaker um and therefore weakened god actually and i, I think if you look at what's happening in the church you can see that quite clearly in the institutional church at least, now, I don't mean everybody's fellowship, but in, in the inst institutional church, we've weakened God because God now likes everything that we do. God now tolerates everything that we do. God now is at our beck and call, really, because the church is now made up of people largely running the church who think that they're somebody instead of knowing that they're nobody. And it's... It, it's, it was the work of the enemy to do that, and he was successful in it, has been successful. There's a quote I have from, um, if I can find it here, A.W. Tozer, you know I love A.W. Tozer's books, I love them. And he's, it, one of his books, The Knowledge of the Holy, he says in that book, what comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What you think about God is the clearest indicator of your spiritual future. And the great issue he was talking about, Isaiah, was the same as the one in ours. Many people have lost sight of the awesome holiness of God. And that's the thing, isn't it? Because God took on flesh and came and lived down here, we have brought Christ down to our level. So now he is the provider of everything we need. He's the, the one who's got to be at our beck and call to a certain extent. And... And he's not held up as the great God, the great I am, the great self-existent creator God that he is. And because of that, his holiness is dethroned. His otherness, he's like us now. And I mean, all those bumper stickers, you know, WWJD, what would Jesus do? <laughs> what would Jesus do? <laughs> you know, um, that's what we do now. What, what, what would Jesus do? Well, he'd forgive. Well, what would Jesus do? Well, he, he, he'd, he'd be with sinners. Well, what would Jesus do? Well, he'd just love. 
And, and those things are true to a certain extent. It's like the enemy's always wrapping true, always wrapping lies in a bit of truth. Mm -hmm. There is truth there that he would forgive, and he is loving. But he was never not holy. He was never exactly like you and me. Mm -hmm. Ever. He's the God man. Even on earth, he was the God man. He was a man without sin. We're going to go to Isaiah, um, and it's Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, where he details his kind of first meeting with God. Um, and uh, I don't think Isaiah is written in chronological order, so I think chapter 6 is, is his beginning. And, um, uh, yeah, I've just realised I didn't put my volume on, sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. I <laughs> and I have to mute you, Linda, because everyone else in the room is muted, so I have to mute you too. <laughs> yes, I'm going to try and do that now. So you must stop speaking while I try to do it, because I don't know exactly where it is now. So long since I've done it. Can you mute yourself, Linda, on your... Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, so... Uh, I can't remember what I was saying. What was I saying? Isaiah 6. Yes, thank you. So Isaiah chapter 6 details his, I think, his first meeting with God. And, but Isaiah, we could go back to Isaiah 1 and see why God is saying what he's saying to him. Um, so Isaiah chapter 6, in the, so from verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongues. tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Interesting in those eight verses, in the ending of, uh, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, who will go for us? And it's this same idea of, a triune God, the, in, the um, understanding that God is three in one, that he is three in one. Um, and then Isaiah, of course, says, yeah, here am I, send, send me. Um, uh, it, 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 to put the timing of this in context, uh, King Uzziah uh, has just died. It's 739 BC, and he reigned for 52 years in Israel. And in his reign, during his reign, Israel had really prospered. They had done really well in all sorts of ways. There was a huge growth in building and construction. They, they, their farming kind of went through the roof. Their agriculture was really uh, uh, bringing forth great harvests. They had major victories over their enemies in his reign. And um, they were able to bring, build strong defenses. Um, and you can read about it in Second Chronicles chapter 26. So if you wanted to read about his reign, you could read about it there. It was a really good reign. But if you do go to Second Chronicles 26, which we will go to actually just briefly, Second Chronicles 26, so go back a little bit. Um, and you will read what happened um, during the reign alongside of their success. So... Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 1 to 15. And all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the place of his father, Amaziah. Amaziah. So it's about 790 BC, and they've made Uzziah king of Judah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jekylah of Jerusalem. He did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. 
He continued to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding through the vision of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. Now he went out and warred against the Philistines and broke down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jabne and the wall of Ashdod. And he built cities in the area of Ashdod and among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians who lived in Gerbile and the Mernites. The Ammonites also gave tribute to Uzziah and his fame extended to the border of Egypt for he became very strong. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and the valley gate and at the corner buttress and fortified them. He built towers in the wilderness and hewed many cisterns, for he had much livestock, both in the lowland and the plain. He also had ploughmen and vine dressers in the hill country and the fertile fields, for he loved the soil. Moreover, Uzziah had an army ready for battle, which entered combat by divisions according to the number of their muster, prepared by Jael, the scribe, and Massey, the official, under the direction of Hananiah, one of the king's officers. The total number of the heads of the households of valiant warriors was 2,600. Under their direction was an elite army of 307,500 who could wage war with great power to help the king against the enemy. Moreover, Uzziah prepared for all the army shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, and sling stones. In Jerusalem, he made engines of war invented by skillful men to be on the towers and on the corners for the purpose of shooting arrows and great stones. Hence his fame spread, for he was marvelously helped until he was strong. But when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptedly, and he was unfaithful to the Lord his God, for he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. What so, happen, so often happens, doesn't it, as you read through the history of Israel and as you look at our own world, that immediately people start to prosper and do well and gain uh, wealth or whatever it is. They start to think that it's all about them and they become really important rather than God. And that's exactly what you see throughout Israel's history. As fast as they were being blessed by God and, be, and prospering, they were starting to turn away, thinking that they had done it for themselves. And, um, and I think that there, probably at that time, there were loads of people going to the temple. They were bringing their sacrifices. They were doing all the right things. They were going through the motions, but they still were not worshipping God. They were thinking that it was all about them, that they had become prosperous, they had become successful, they had become the, the big nation of the time, and they were not afraid of anybody because they were strong. I mean, you could look at what the West, couldn't you, <laughs> over the last hundred years mm -hmm. and see that process. That, that, I mean, I think, I think it must be true that at the end of second, that during the Second World War, God must have been with this nation, this nation, the UK, because we were alone at a certain point, weren't we? We were alone, and the king called for the day of prayer, and the whole nation prayed. I mean, that's quite an incredible feat. I mean, that's just in, in 1940 or 41. And that's not that long ago, actually, 60, 70, 80 years. I mean, but it, it, everybody prayed, or, well, you know, every, the nation prayed. And what happened? Dunkirk happened. A miracle of miracles. And yet, from that moment on, when the war really turned in people's minds, they started to understand, we can win this war. God is on our side. Here, I'm talking about. From then after the war, it started to be more and more and more, more consciously about us rather than about God. I'm not trying to say that Britain was the same as, as Israel. It's not. But I'm trying to make the comparison. When people get successful, when they start to prosper, they start to think that it's all about them and not about God. And that's exactly what happened in Isaiah's day. He's preaching from the, the year of King Uzziah's death. It says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. And, and, and he's preaching in that context. He's preaching to a people who have turned away from God as their, as their deliverance, as their redemption, as their saviour, as their God. And I think that's where we are. I definitely think that's where we are in the church. And so 
when you, when you understand that that's the backdrop of when he began to preach, and then you turn to Isaiah chapter 1, and, it, and, and God's giving this vision. It says, the vision of Isaiah concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. When you start to see that, that he's seeing this, and it's against that backdrop, Look at verse 1 to 4. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth. This is Isaiah 1. For the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not understand. My people do not understand. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly, they have abandoned the Lord. And then verse 11. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. I mean, what, what a thing to be saying. That Isaiah was saying these things, that God was giving him this vision and he was saying these things to the people of, supposedly of God. And, and, you know, I can't help but think that that must be what God is saying to the, the church in the West. I hate your multiplied sacrifices. I hate your fake worship. I hate this. Stop doing it. Stop doing it. And, I, you know, not every detail is the same, of course. But the, the, the context here is Isaiah was sent to preach to a people who were saying they belonged to God but actually did not care about God at all and had turned away from him. And I really think that that's where we are today in our kind of institutionalized Christianity because it has become all about us and not about God. It's become all about how people feel and not about how God feels. And here in Isaiah, it's so clear. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. I mean, that's God speaking. You know, I think we have, you know, I've written here the the temple that was once filled with the glory of God there was a national treasure, a symbol of tradition to them now. It was a building. It was, look at this wonderful building. In Jesus' day, when he comes along, that's what his disciples say. That's what Peter and John and Andrew, they're saying to him, have you looked at this building? Look at it, it's amazing. And talking about its stones and its beauty and everything else. And Jesus will say to them, doesn't he, in, you know, in three days this temple is going to be torn down. And this temple is going to disappear. And just 30 or 40 years after they're pointing out this beautiful building to Jesus, it's destroyed by the Roman Empire. Completely and utterly destroyed. And, and this, this idea now that we're, you know, in my village, they collect money for the building of the little church in our village. It's, and there's no worship that goes on in there. We have a service once a month and people go, but it's for a breakfast or it's for this or it's for that. And it's like the village society. And it's good on that level. It's good. People come together. and they, But it's not worshipping God. It's nothing about God. And I think a lot of our churches, that's what they've become. It's about people and not about God. It's about how we feel and not about how he feels. It's, it's all of this endless rote this endless tradition, this endless continuing. And I think God is saying, I'm weary of it. I'm weary of it. And, and I think we can back that up because Peter says, doesn't he, that it's time for judgment to begin. And if it begins with us first in the household of God, it's going to begin in the household of God. And you can see it. I mean, when you've got, what is it, rave in the nave in the church? Is that in Bristol? Where they're going to have a rave in the nave. They're going to play all this music that's secular rock 
you know, or a helter-skelter or whatever it was, you know, in a church, you know, we're going to make it a fun fair. And so in the middle of this huge, beautiful building, they've, they put up a helter-skelter thing. They were all sliding down it and having fun. And, you know, I mean, it's just mind-blowing where we are. And yet, they must be thinking that there's no judgment of God, there's no holiness of God, there's no anything of God that, would, that they think they can do those things. They can do those things without any, you know. I've said here, we have people today exactly the same as Isaiah's day. People who come to church to worship, but they lie to their parents, they fiddle their taxes, they cheat on their wives, they commit abortion, they throw themselves into materialism and the pursuit of happiness, and it makes them indistinguishable from the world. Mm. When I became a Christian in 1993, um, and then into 94, it's the end of 93, um, somebody said to me, if you come to church and you feel comfortable and you're not a believer, you're in the wrong place. You should not feel comfortable in church as an unbeliever. I mean, that's just the... Why, why would you not be comfortable? Because, because the people in that building are worshipping a God they can't see but they know exists. They're, worship, they're reading from a word that they believe to be the living and active word of God. Mm. They're living their lives according to what they read, what they watch on TV. We were just talking, I was talking with someone about it, you know, what you're watching on TV, you know that Christ is watching that with you. Mm. What you listen to in the car when you're driving from one place to another, what you talk to over dinner with people that you, you have dinner with or your family, those things are all important because you are the witness of the, the living Jesus Christ and you are upholding his reputation. I can't tell you the number of programs I've had to stop watching <laughs> over the years. I'm, in a, I'm a slow study and I hang on with grim death, you know, on things I like to watch, but I've had to give up so many things because there's just too much of, of non-God in there. I can't watch it anymore. I can't watch it. But those are the choices we have to make, aren't they? They're the choices. And we're making them on the basis of what God says and what he does. We're not making them on the basis of what other people think about those things. So all the issues of our day, transgender, uh, abortion, Israel and Gaza, every single issue that's going on in our day, Russia and Ukraine and all of the things that are going on, we don't make our decisions based on those things. We make them based on what we know God has said. Mm. And, and that has to be the road we walk. It has to be the path we take. It has to be the way we speak and the way we think because if we go off of that, there is no witness for God on the planet. That's, you know, Moses was a nobody. And he turned aside to look at God in this burning bush. He turned aside to see what he thought was a burning bush, and it turned out to be God. Well, you and I have already turned aside. We've already met the living Jesus Christ. You're only here because you are a believer in Jesus. You wouldn't come otherwise. You're here because you want to know more about him. And he wants to tell us, I am a holy, holy, holy God and I have a standard that you are required to live to. You can't do it on your own. I will enable you to do it, but you have to turn aside and see what that standard is and you have to choose. This is the way my life is going to go. This is the way my life is going to go. Can I ask, answer it at the end, Diana? So Isaiah describes in Isaiah chapter 6 what he sees. He descri describes what he sees. And, um, and what you see in Isaiah chapter 6 is that he cannot describe it. He cannot describe God. Because God is so magnificent and, and beyond description. He's beyond description. Look at what he says. He, in, in chapter 6, he says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. He doesn't have words to describe the Lord because all he can describe is the train of his robes <laughs> filling the temple. If, if you saw Jesus or you saw God, you would, you would be describing to me what you saw, wouldn't you? You'd be saying his face was shining. John, in, in the Revelation, sees Jesus Christ and he describes who, his, his body and his face and his voice. But Isaiah can't even do that. 
He, he's, he just cannot do it. He just says his, the, his, the train of his robe is filling the temple. And just before we go too far into that description and, and to finish those verses, John, in John chapter 12, verse 37 to 42, John 12, again, you don't have to go there if you don't want to because we're getting right back to Isaiah. But in John 12, John makes it clear to us that Isaiah saw Jesus. So look at what he says. In, in John chapter 12, um, let's say, uh, where will I begin? Not f- yeah, I'll start in verse 32. And I, Jesus, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd then answered him, we have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, for a little while the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing him. in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, has he, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe, for Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted, and I heal them. And then here it is. Verse 41, these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus Christ and spoke of him. And he's, Jesus is quoting what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6. And John is giving understanding that what Isaiah, who Isaiah saw, high and lifted up, you know, high and lifted up, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple, was in fact Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So how does he describe him? He describes him as just his robe is filling the temple. He says the foundations were trembling. The foundations of the temple were trembling. The temple was filled with smoke. Seraphim were flying, you know, in the, in the uh, all around, and they were they covered their faces. They covered their faces. Why do these seraphim, who have not sinned, have to cover their faces? Why can they not look at the God who is seated on the throne? Because Isaiah is emphasizing the holiness of this God, that even a sinless seraphim cannot look, gaze upon the God who is seated there. Isaiah can't describe the face of this God. He can't describe the God who is seated on the throne because he is beyond description. And, and, and John is telling us he was talking about Jesus. He saw Christ. He saw Christ. Well, tell me, how, how do you hear Jesus described in our day? How, how, how do we talk about him? How does the church talk about him? How do they present him? They don't present him as the Christ that we can't look at his face. The Christ who is beyond description we don't present him even as John presents him in Revelation. That his, his, his feet are burnished bronze and, his, and there's you know, kind of a sword coming from his mouth and he's, he's just brilliant light. You where do you hear people talking about Jesus like that? You don't hear it. And why? Because we have dethroned him and made him like us. He's just a better version of us. He's kinder and he's more loving and he's more forgiving and he doesn't do things wrong and he, he always prays well and he's this and he's that and he's the other thing, but he's not the holy, holy, holy God who created all things. You see, you know, many times in scripture, in Exodus, only the pavement is described. Many times people cannot truly describe the God that they see. Moses, in, in what we read in Moses chapter 3, he can't describe God. He doesn't describe God. He just talks about a bush that is burning and God speaking to him. And what is it the angels are crying? They're crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. Um, the whole earth is full of his glory. 
the seraphim that are, cry, are flying are crying, holy, holy, holy. Only that word is triple emphasized in scripture. Jesus says many times, truly, truly, I say to you, or there are other words that are repeated twice, but only the word holy is repeated three times in scripture. And that's the only place apart from Revelation, which is a quote of this. So this, this con concept or this reality that Christ and God, the triune God of whom Christ is a, is a personage, is a holy, holy, holy God. Holy means set apart, other. He is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, different to us. That's the message of scripture. Christ is not like you. He is not like me. God is not like me and he is not like you. He is totally other than us. And, and that's so important because the only way we can come to him is if he enables that coming, if he enables it. And the way he enabled it was for us to come through Christ. You cannot come to God any other way. You can't bow down and worship him in any other way. The way that we worship is to come through Christ. We come through Christ. We worship the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the way it's written out for us. So I think if, if, if holy is the only word that's repeated three times in Scripture, it must be foundational to who God is, who Christ is. It must be foundational to who he is. And when you hear him say, as we did in John chapter 8, when he's telling the Jews that are following him, I am, before Abraham was, I am, He's claiming that holiness for himself. He's saying that the holy, holy, holy God took on human flesh in order to make the way for an unholy people to make contact and to be received by a holy, holy, holy God. And I don't think it... Um, I think in a way our understanding of that raises us up. As we lift Christ up, we are also raised up. If we bring Christ down, we are also brought down. It's in the exaltation of Jesus Christ that the church finds its glory, finds its position, finds its meaning and its purpose, individually for each of us and collectively. If, you had a per if you'd lived a perfect life, and suddenly Christ walked in the room, as he is now, as Isaiah saw him, what do you think you'd do? Even if you'd lived a perfect life, you'd never sinned. Well, it's impossible, but even if you hadn't sinned very often, even if you were a good girl or a good boy all your life, and you didn't do anything bad, if Jesus walked into the room, you would fall flat, dead on your face, because you would not be able to stand in front of this glorious, perfect, wonderful Christ. And that's what Isaiah did. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. Isaiah is a prophet. He's going to be a prophet. He's going to be talking about the Lord. He's going to be worshipping God. He's going to be calling people through 66 books, 66 chapters, sorry, Calling people to God, turn again, turn again, repent, repent, repent. He's the one, the one prophet really in the Old Testament who has the whole gamut of, of the timing and the purpose of God in his one book. Mm -hmm. Isaiah talks about the first coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ and the millennial reign and then beyond. He talks about the whole history of the world and the universe other prophets talk about various parts of that, but none of them speak about the whole thing. He is a prophet amongst prophets. And, and he is standing before, the, before God in the throne room of God, and all he can say is, woe is me. Woe is me. You know, I want to cry because I, I just don't hear people saying that. I don't hear people saying that in my fellowships, in my, co in my church. I don't hear them. I don't hear that. And, and maybe they do say it. I don't know. It's a judgment call on mine. And maybe they do privately, but they don't say it together when we're together. 
They don't say it when we're together. Why not? We worship a God who is glorious. So glorious that if we saw him, we would literally fall flat. Because he is beyond. Don't we want this God? Don't you want this God? I want that God. I don't want a demeaned Jesus Christ. I don't want a Christ who is nothing and who looks exactly like you or exactly like me. I don't want a, a Christ who is demeaned and dethroned. And I want a Christ who is risen and, and lifted up and glorious. I want to know this powerful Christ. And we're asking the question, who is Jesus? Well, this is who he is. He is the, the God that Uzziah's... Uh, Isaiah saw, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the throne of his robe filled the temple, and the foundations of the threshold were trembling, and seraphim flew here, there, and everywhere, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And Isaiah sees him as the Lord of hosts. Isaiah hears the seraphim say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the Lord Sabaoth, it's Jehovah Sabaoth, and it, I'll tell you, we'll come into it more in the latest sessions, but he is the Lord of armies, he is the Lord of armies, armies of angels, he commands armies of angels, he commands everything that goes on in this universe is at his command, ultimately. It's only if we know him to be who he is that we can live in victory that we can have the assurance that our things that are happening to us now are part of a grand plan of God, that he will work into a tapestry of beauty, and that when we see him, think about this, when we see Christ, we will be like him. That's what John says in 1 John. He says, we don't know yet what we'll be like, but we do know that when we see him, we will be like him. What does that mean? Does it mean that I'm going to be like this? Does it mean that I'm going to be transfigured? I think it does. It means that I'm going to be transfigured in Christ. I will be different People will not be able to look at me and say, oh, that's, that's Anne, isn't it? No, because I'll have a new body and I'll be a new thing and, and I, will be more, I will be like Christ. I want that. I want to be that. I don't want Christ to be like me. I don't. I don't want to bring him down to where I am or to where you are. I want him to stay where he is, high and lifted up. I want him to be the transfigured Jesus Christ at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to understand that he is part of the triune God. You know, I think we need to figure out what would our response be if Jesus walked in the room. Today, what would your response be? What do you really think you would say and do? if the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords walked in today. You know, I think that the problem for us is that um, loads of people today think that Jesus is just the sort of spiritual side of ourselves. That's why people can say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not a Christian. Because they think that God is just this, the spiritual side of who they are. And Christ and God has nothing to do with the spiritual side of, of who we are. They were, as it's written here in Isaiah's day, just as in ours, the people were coming into the temple. But they weren't much different from the people outside. And the worship that they did, the experience of worship that you have in your church, send you home maybe, feeling good about yourself, but it's nothing to do with worshipping the God who sits seated on the throne. Often, not always, but often. And it brings no lasting change. When you go to church and you hear your message and you worship with, your, with the people that are there and you talk to them afterwards, and if you are not talking about a God who has a standard of of living, of excellence that you cannot achieve unless you know him and his spirit works within you. If we're not sharing that God, if we're not sharing his word, if we're not sharing who this God is, this Christ is, then 
there'll be no moral change in our life. There'll be nothing to differentiate between us and other people. Sorry, Diana, just for the thing. So I think people are going in. They're going into churches. They, they hear the uplifting words. They, they do a bit of singing. They have a cup of tea and a piece of cake or whatever at the end. And you say, hello, how are you? And you mean it. You mean it. You mean that in your churches and, in your, and you want to be kind and you want to pray for people if they need it, but the whole purpose of coming together is to worship God. Mm. Is to worship God. If not, the only other thing would be to meet in small fellowships in your homes and come together to look at the apostles' teaching, to break bread and to pray for one another. If you're coming together as a big group, then the only purpose for that is to stand and sing and shout of the glory of God. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't go into many fellowships like that, churches like that. So, woe is me, for I am a man who has been with unclean lips. And then his, his tongue, uh, his lips are touched the very place that he's identified as the place that is needing help. The angel comes and takes the the coal and touches his lips. He touched my mouth with it, verse 7, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. That was your conversion experience, that God touched your heart with his burning coal and you are forgiven. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here, I'm, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Mm-hmm. Isaiah goes because he'd seen the risen Jesus Christ, because he'd seen the Lord high and lifted up. Mm-hmm. He was ready to say, Here am I, because he'd seen the glory of God, the holiness of God, the wonder of God. And because he'd been brought to the place where he understood I'm a nobody in a world of nobodies who need this somebody. He's seen who God is and he's received his grace and now he's ready. So that's the question for us, isn't it? As we begin this, you know, who is Jesus? You know, are we ready to make known to people who God is to a people who've actually lost sight of who God is. Beginning within the churches that we belong to, within the fellowships that we go to, are we ready to make known the God who is, the I am, the God who exists outside of anything else, the God who exists when nothing existed, the God who is, the God who walked onto the stage in Genesis chapter 1 and said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Are we willing and ready to make that God known? Because that God is returning very soon. And we have to be speaking about him to people who have lost sight of who he is. God is holy, holy, holy. It's foundational to his character. I'm just going to go through the last bits. Sin is terrible. Sin is terrible because it is an offence against a holy God. We don't talk very much about individual sin in our sessions because I think that we have to come to the Lord in repentance. We have to cross the bridge so that we get to Jesus before we can start looking at the individual sins. But once we're there, and we're all there, we have to now understand sin is an offence against a holy God. It's an offence. Atonement is necessary because sin is ruins us, ruins us. Woe is me, for I am ruined. Woe is me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. Sin ruins us. And it's an offence against God. And grace is amazing because it flows out of his holiness. You cannot have amazing grace without a holy, holy, holy God. And, and the reason that grace is amazing is, is not the grace itself. It's the fact that it comes from this holy, holy, holy God who doesn't need any of us, but has chosen any way to love us. It's the amazingness of the, the enormity of the grace that was required to save you and to save me and to save Isaiah. So that's the reason really for this course.
you'd never think so, would you, because we were all over the place, but that's the reason for this course, that we will begin really like Isaiah to understand and appreciate the wonder of Jesus, the wonder of who he is, just who he is, um, and what God has done for us in him, the amazing grace, and that understanding it, we'll want nothing else but to serve that God, that Christ. And I, I do think, I mean, people have been saying it for hundreds of years. That's what is always thrown back at me when, when I talk about the fact that it's going to be soon. People say, well, the church has been saying that for hundreds and hundreds of years, probably 2,000 years. They expected him to come back when just after he was resurrected. Mm. So, but I want to live as if he's coming tomorrow. Mm. That's the thing. I don't know for sure that he is. I don't know the exact time. But I want to live as if he's coming tomorrow. Mm. And I think he's brought me to that place. So therefore there has to be a purpose in it. Father, thank you that your word is amazing. Thank you that your grace is amazing. Thank you that you will show us the, the holiness of who you are, the, f the fact that you, Lord Jesus, are holy, holy, holy God, and that you are the Lord of armies, and that there is victory in knowing you, and, and that we have chosen, chosen to put our trust in you, and that was the right choice. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for the assurance that knowing who you are gives us. Thank you that we don't have to cast about in our own thinking and our own ways and trying to find things. Thank you that you've written this whole 66 books to us, Lord, to tell us about who you are, who you are, and who we are when we come to you. So I thank you, Lord, for today. I thank you for every blessing that you are going to bestow upon us. I thank you that it may not feel like a blessing, but it will ultimately be so, Lord. For you have promised that you work all things together for good, for those who love you and who are called according to your purpose. And that's us, Lord. That's us. So I thank you, Lord, for the truth of that. And I praise you, Lord. And we want to say we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.